Why do the evil people in this world, the liars, cheats, and scammers, so often succeed? I have come to the conclusion that the real reason is all of us. Most of us on this planet are basically honest, mostly decent. In most situations, we tend to tell the truth and treat each other with some kindness. Not surprisingly, we also take it for granted that those around us will behave in the same way. But our assumption that most people are honest most of the time makes us terribly vulnerable to those bastards who lie and cheat without any conscience. They can completely fool us for quite a long time, sometimes forever, and we don't even realize it. Because we don't lie or cheat, we don't suspect quickly enough that others might be doing this to us. It was Gina Giannopoulos who taught me this painful lesson. Or perhaps I should say Gina Giannopoulos Macmillan, because that was her husband's name. I'm Alex Macmillan, her ex-husband. One morning, the engine in my Lexus started making some weird noises, and I dropped the car off at Marshall Motors, where Dominic had been working on my cars for about 10 years. He called me around lunchtime, but instead of saying that the car was fine, he said, come over immediately. When I got there, he took me into a private office at the back of the house and said, Alex, the engine is fine, only the belt is loose. But there was something else. He looked at me seriously. Someone ruined the brake line. There was just enough hydraulic fluid left for some routine stops, but if you had to go down a steep hill or stop in a hurry, you would crash the car. I stared at him, my mouth open. Six months ago, Gina and I moved into a new, trendy, modern house in the suburbs. It was magnificent, with cathedral ceilings and lots of glass, and it was surrounded by tranquil forest. But it was also at the end of a cul-de-sac off the main street, which sloped steeply down the hill. If I had driven home that evening, I almost certainly would have died. After a couple of minutes, I collected my thoughts a little. Dominic, do me a favor, okay? Don't tell anyone about this yet. Have you fixed it yet? No, buddy, a crime was committed here. Or at least an attempt. I have to call the police. Okay. I thought a little more. How about we do this? Take a photo of the brake line and describe it as you would for the police. But let's not call them yet. Leave the car in the backyard and I'll rent one of your jalopies for a few days. There are security cameras in the parking lot, right? Yes. Dominic looked doubtfully. Here's the thing. Whoever did this will want to hide it when they find out I'm alive. So I bet he'll try to steal that car off the lot in the next few nights. I don't want to call the police until this happens. We will have camera footage to transmit them simultaneously. Forty-five minutes later, I stepped out of my rented blue Corolla and left it in the driveway. I took the rest of the day off. I wanted to think carefully about what was going on. The attempt on my life had to be related to money. I was the president and co-founder of Apex, a $6.8 billion software company in Silicon Valley, and my first instinct was that someone was out to get me out of the way as part of an attack on the company. Carmelita, our cook housekeeper, who usually worked from noon to eight in the evening, had a day off, and the house was quiet. Gina must have gone shopping or played tennis. I wandered around aimlessly, Possible culprits and possible reasons for what was happening were spinning in my head. I picked up the phone and spoke to Jeff Denham, an old friend of mine who runs the security firm Apex uses. Without explaining the reasons to him, I made it clear that I suspected that there was some kind of problem going on. Either some financial irregularities were already in the works, or a future attack on the company. We agreed that his auditors would conduct a full audit of our computers and financial records. I gave Jeff a temporary password that would allow them to access what they needed from my desk in the office and told him I wanted to do it discreetly. We would tell everyone that they are doing a routine check. I then called Meredith, my longtime secretary, and told her to enter a temporary password into my computer and that Jeff's guys would be there later that day. Having finished this, I resumed my aimless wanderings. I walked over to our home computer and poked around, not expecting to find anything. Out of pure, idle curiosity, I tried to open some of Gina's files, including her email. And to my surprise, they were all password protected. 
What does Gina have on our computer that she doesn't want me to see? Other than something unlikely, like planning a surprise party, I couldn't imagine. I made a mental note to ask her about it later. I was drinking tea in the kitchen around 4.30 when Gina came in. She just looked at me and literally collapsed. I had never seen anything like it. Her mouth opened. She turned pale, and her body went limp, leaning against the doorframe. Alex, you... you... what are you doing here? I smiled softly. Actually, honey, I live here. Do you remember? She pulled herself together a little and sat down at the table opposite me. Forcing herself to smile, she said, Of course, baby. It's just, well, you're almost never home this early, and I haven't seen your car outside. Everything happened in an instant. I was about to tell her all about the brake line, but instead I just said, I had a problem with the engine and had to leave it with Dominic for a few days. He traded me one of their jalopies. That's what's sitting in the driveway. Why didn't I tell her the truth? At the time, I think I thought it was because I didn't want to bother her. I didn't want to say, By the way, honey, somebody's trying to kill me. Why scare your wife? But when I thought about it later, it could have been for a completely different reason. Why was she so shocked to see me sitting in the kitchen, not just surprised but stunned, as if it was the most unexpected thing in the world? I didn't understand her reaction, and the more I thought about it later, the more it tormented me. Oh, she said, and I saw her trying to pull herself together. It's good that you came back so early. What are you going to do with dinner? How about we go somewhere now that Carmelita is gone? Great, she said. Let me just take a shower, and maybe we can go to the Andante? She then quickly left the room, and a couple of minutes later, I heard the shower running. I put the cup in the sink and headed to the bedroom, thinking I'd wash my face and change into something more casual before we headed out. The bedroom door was almost closed, and to my surprise, as I got closer, I heard Gina talking quietly and urgently on the phone. Why did she turn on the shower and then call someone? I didn't hear the phone ring, so it must have been her calling. I haven't heard much. Just, no doubt. I have no idea. No, of course not. Yes, we'll have to. Okay, baby, bye. Not much, but more than enough to freeze me in place. She was talking to Jeff Denham, my friend and security guru. His middle name was Dowd, and I've been calling him Dowdle since about eighth grade. Gina adopted the nickname from me. There was no doubt who was on the other end of the line. I waited until she hung up and headed to the bathroom. I then waited another two minutes before entering the bedroom and changing clothes. I washed my face in the guest bathroom so as not to disturb Gina's shower. My brain was racing. What the hell is going on? Could Gina and my friend Jeff have been involved in what happened to my car? Despite the evidence of the last ten minutes, it seemed completely impossible. Gina and I were married for eight years. I was 46 and she was 37. I was married and divorced once when I was 20. And I had two wonderful children whom I only saw during the summer holidays and had quick visits from time to time because their mother moved them 2,000 miles away after the divorce. I first met Gina when she visited the Apex offices while working as a sales representative for the computer support firm we did business with. I made it my business to find out who she was and then set up a lunch date with a friend from her group who could casually introduce us. It was worth the effort. Even if you wake her from a sound sleep, Gina will be one of the ten most beautiful women you have ever seen, and when she has time to do her clothes and makeup, she is absolutely stunning. Almost five feet ten inches, with long raven hair and dark eyes, high cheekbones and a pert mouth, and a strong athletic body. She also has a look a way of walking, moving, presenting herself, looking you in the eye that says, I know I'm hot, and I know you think so too. From the very first time I became interested in her, I knew that I would have a lot of competition, and it was a pleasant surprise that we were dating soon and then dating seriously, and about a year later, engaged to get married. I'm good-looking but not handsome, and I'm nine years older than Gina. I knew that my success in business and my money had to be part of the attraction for her, and that didn't bother me. Why be successful if it doesn't get you foot in the door with gorgeous women? 
and we had an ironclad prenuptial agreement that limited her to no more than a million dollars if we divorced in less than 20 years. So I was confident that she loved me as much as she loved my money. We would have a very good life together, and if she liked being rich with me, that would be great, as long as she made me happy too. Gina made me very happy. She spent a lot of money, but I had it, so no problem. She was energetic and lively, very sociable and cheerful. She made a lot of friends, dragged me to a lot of parties, and flirted with a lot of guys. But at the end of the evening, she would come home with me and usually take my socks off. Gina was experienced and enthusiastic, as adventurous in bed as she was anywhere else. She exhausted me, and I was completely happy. But the events of the last few hours had changed everything, or at least threatened to change everything. I needed to think twice about it, primarily because Dowdle seemed to be involved. Under other circumstances, he would have been the first person I called. In fact, I already called him and instructed his people to look into Apex's finances. I now realized that I might have made a grave mistake in alerting him to my suspicions. Thank God I didn't mention that someone got into the car. Neither he nor Gina knew that I knew about it, at least not yet. That evening I tested my acting skills to the limit. Gina and I went to Andante and had a nice dinner and a nice bottle of Chianti. I was incredibly thoughtful, but tried my best not to seem withdrawn or distant. I made sure the conversation was moving along, and when Gina took off her shoe and slid her foot up and down my leg under the table, I responded with a smile and a few careful caresses. I knew that the evening would end with athletics in bed. This, of course, was Gina's habit after a good dinner and good wine, and I was wondering what to do, but the right decision was obviously to go with the flow, not only because I didn't want to arouse any suspicion in her, but also because sex with my wife was the most fun I've ever had. Suspicion or not, I was going to enjoy it at least one more time. We didn't do anything unusual for us. When she came out of the bathroom in a short red nightie, I was waiting for her naked in bed. And then we hugged for a few minutes, said, Wow, and I love you, to each other, and fell asleep. Exciting but typical romp in bed after a nice but typical dinner out. Nothing unusual, at least that's what it seemed. One of my talents is the ability to think about a problem in my mind while I'm doing other things, like having dinner with my wife or having sex with her. So when I woke up the next morning, I knew exactly what I would do to get to the bottom of the mysterious attempt on my life and my wife's apparent involvement. I woke up early and began preparing for a quick trip to Los Angeles. I packed a travel bag and asked the company travel agent to book me a regular three-day round-trip flight and a room at the Beverly Wilshire Hotel, where I always stayed in Los Angeles. I ordered a limousine to the airport, ate a quick breakfast, then went into the bedroom and woke Gina. Baby, I'm sorry to bother you. I smiled at her, enjoying the sight of her beautiful face as her eyes slowly opened and she smiled back at me. Good morning, Alex, she murmured, pulling me towards her for a long kiss, then another. God, how good she felt. I was tempted to tear off my clothes and jump into her bed, but I resisted. I need to go to Los Angeles, honey, I said. This morning I received a couple of emails about a meeting we were trying to organize. It all happened suddenly, and I will need to be there for a couple of days. It was a lie, but a very plausible one. I traveled frequently, and business trips often came up at short notice. Okay, darling. I'll warm your bed. Will you come back on Friday? Yes. That's the plan. Just make sure you're the only one keeping the bed warm, okay, Gina? She smiled at me, then pulled me tighter into another hug. There's no one here but me, baby. Just think how excited I'll be by Friday, she whispered in my ear. In the limo... I marveled at my wife's ability to lie to me. Either I was completely wrong and she had nothing to do with the attempt on my life, or she was a damn good actress. Moreover, a cold-blooded monster. I hoped I was wrong, but I didn't understand how this could happen. On the short flight from San Jose to Los Angeles, I thought through some of the details of my plan. The key to the solution was complete secrecy. Since Jeff Denham seemed to be involved in this matter, 
I had to avoid any action that might lead him to suspect me. And since he was the best security guard in the entire Bay Area, that meant I had to bring someone from afar. On the way from the airport, I stopped at an electronics store and paid cash for my discarded cell phone. Then, after checking into the Beverly Wilshire Hotel, I called Dan Camoran and arranged to meet him for lunch near his office downtown. Dan was my right-hand man when I started Apex, and we both got very rich when it took off. Three years ago, we parted on amicable terms. He moved with his family to Los Angeles and took a job at a financial services company that, thanks to his intelligence, flourished. Dan and I saw each other a couple of times a year, so no one would think it strange that I was visiting him. We sat over sandwiches and a couple of beers at the restaurant's outdoor terrace, reminiscing about old times and sharing stories about recent challenges and triumphs. He asked about Jean and told me about his wife Linda and what their children were doing. But when we finished eating, I leaned forward and spoke more seriously. I'd like to ask you two favors, Dan, if you don't mind. He looked interested, and I continued. I have reason to believe that I may have some problems inside Apex. Do you have a security company that you trust? Absolutely, he said. Top of the securities. Alan Newman, the guy who runs it, is first class. But you still have Jeff Denham, don't you? Yes, but I need someone from the outside. Here's my first favor. Could you call Newman and tell him that a good friend would like to talk to him on the phone and get advice, but without saying my name? Without hesitation, Dan called on his cell phone and made an appointment to meet his friend later that day. Thank you, Dan. I'll ask you to forget this ever happened. Now here's another favor of mine. This is actually a question I want to ask you. In the time you've known Gina, have you ever seen her? Acting inappropriately or generally suspiciously? To my surprise, Dan looked away and his face turned red. I waited, and finally he looked at me again with a shy expression I had never seen before. Alex? I... It's difficult, you know. A little awkward. I hope you don't want to hit me. About four years ago, in the last few months before I resigned as COO and moved here, Gina sort of flirted with me a few times. But this wasn't just regular flirting, the kind of thing beautiful women do all the time. She came very close to proposing to me several times. I must have looked surprised because Dan raised his hands defensively as if he was afraid I would hit him. It wasn't obvious, Alex. She never said, do you want to take me to bed? Or something like that. She came close to the line, but always subtly enough that it was never revealed. The offer was there for me to grasp. But if I pretended not to understand, it was ambiguous enough that neither of us felt embarrassed. That's why I never talked to you about it. I felt very strange, believe me. But I didn't want you to be angry, either, at me or at her, when it was so hard to define. I was afraid you'd think I was imagining it. He sat for a minute, looking unhappy. I think I understand, Dan, and I'm not angry with you. So you just let subtle invitations go over your head and after a while she backed down? That's it. This went on for a few weeks and then just stopped. Gina was back to being the friendly, slightly flirtatious woman she had been in the past. It was weird, like she was experimenting on me or something. Was there anything else? Any other strange behavior that you noticed? He nodded, still looking unhappy. This is even worse, Alex. Right after we moved here, Linda told me that she had a farewell dinner with Barbara Daniels, Josh's wife. Barbara was very upset. She told Linda that Josh cheated on her, and she was pretty sure it was with Gina. Josh Daniels had been at Apex for seven years and was now our CFO. I leaned forward. How did Barbara know? She didn't know. She's not sure. She'd caught Josh lying about his whereabouts a couple of times, and there was something else that convinced her he was cheating. But about Gina, it was much more doubtful. Maybe he came home one day smelling of her perfume or something like that. I don't remember everything. But I know Linda and I struggled together with whether or not I should tell you about this. I know for sure that if she ever sleeps with someone behind my back, I want my friends to tell me. But the thing is, it was all so unconvincing. I hope I'm right, but I didn't want to ruin your marriage over something that might never happen.
We talked for a few more minutes and then parted. I wasn't mad at Dan. It was clear that he did what he thought was best at the time. But his stories certainly deepened my sense that my wife was right in the middle of some conspiracy against me and my company. My phone conversation with Alan Newman was short and sweet. As soon as he picked up, I got straight to the point. Mr. Newman, I need a top-notch security company to help me solve a confidential problem. As highly as Dan speaks of you, I'd rather it wasn't someone associated with me or my friends. So I'm wondering who else is really good in this area. Who would you hire yourself for a very serious, very confidential matter that requires financial and computer knowledge? First, I'd like to call Barry Asimov in San Diego. His company and mine work together on some things. He's incredibly smart, hires good people, and pays them well. And I've always been able to trust him. At my request, Newman left me alone, called Asimov, and made an appointment for the next morning at 10 a.m., again, without mentioning my name. On the way back to the hotel, I called Dan Camorin again. I asked him to rent a car from Hertz on his credit card and arrange for his friend Elliot to come pick it up at the airport the next morning. This way I could have a car without being traced back to me. Returning to the Beverly Wilshire, I quickly ate dinner, went upstairs, and, as usual, after an evening conversation with Gina, went to bed. The next morning, after eating breakfast in my room, I put on slightly ratty sweet pants, sunglasses, and a San Francisco Giants cap and left the hotel through a side entrance before taking a taxi to the Hertz office in Los Angeles. By 9.45, I was already in San Diego and parked in the lot next to Asimov's office. Barry Asimov was a short, stout man in his early 40s. His hair was bad and his brown suit didn't fit him very well. In short, he was a completely expressionless figure. But within 10 minutes, I realized that he was one of the smartest people I had met in a long time. I knew I had to trust someone, and I decided it would be Asimov. I got straight to the point. Mr. Asimov, I need a security company that can do serious work for me. It's out of this area. It would require a lot of high-tech computer work, and it's extremely confidential. I am willing to pay very well for what I need, in addition to covering all your people's expenses. The work may take several weeks, and I would not be surprised if your fee ends up being seven figures. He looked at me continuously for several minutes. What made you come to us? And why do you think we can handle it? Someone recommended me to Alan Newman, and Newman spoke highly of you. Why not just use Newman? He is very good. Because I'm trying to cover my tracks. When we get into this, you'll understand why I have good reason to be careful. Newman called you, but he never got my name, so it will be quite difficult to trace me back to you. Not impossible, but difficult. We talked a little more about preparation, and then Asimov said, If this sounds like something we can handle, we're in. I told him everything. Who I am, what I do and what it costs, and the recent attempt on my life. I told him I suspected Gina and Denham were involved and why. And I repeated Dan Cameron's story about Gina's behavior and her possible affair with Josh Daniels, although I never mentioned Cameron's name. When I finished, Asimov asked me several leading questions. He clearly knew his stuff. Then he leaned back in his chair. I know Jeff Denham, at least by reputation. It must be very spicy. Many places in Silicon Valley swear by its work. So if he does something questionable, we will have to be very sensitive in how we go after him. We talked a little more, and finally Asimov said, Here's what I recommend. Essentially, you need two things. Someone needs to look very carefully at your books, internal documents and memos, and someone else needs to look into Denim. Your wife and other high-level people at Apex. David Carlos is my best computer guy. I'll take him for my first job. He has two, three financiers who work for him. They can analyze what they find. And I'll ask Vera Anderson to assemble an observation group for the second part. Thirty minutes later, the four of us were sitting in a conference room, eating takeout sandwiches and discussing my situation. Asimov mostly stayed out of the way, allowing Carlos and Anderson to ask questions. But every now and then, he would put in his two cents, and I always admired his gumption. I couldn't shake the feeling that I was in good hands. 
By mid-afternoon, I was driving back to Los Angeles. To my relief, Asimov understood why I could not immediately give him a large advance and was ready to trust me on the basis of a bill drawn up by a notary in his office. Carlos was going to dig into Apex through my computer, which was connected to other important computers at the company. His method was simple in itself. He made me remember the URL of Asimov's company website. Whenever I was alone in my office for two hours or more, I would log into this web address and download and install a piece of software from the site onto my computer. The software allowed Carlos and his team to download and copy any files they wanted to view from my computer and those it was connected to. Whenever I had to leave the office, I closed the connection, logged out of the website, deleted the software from the computer, and covered my tracks in the usual way by deleting the browser history and so on. It wasn't a completely untraceable method, but only an expert who was already suspicious and had thoroughly searched my computer would have seen what was going on. Carlos estimated that within 20 hours of searching online, he could find and download everything he needed to see if there was anything wrong with Apex. Part of Anderson's job will involve routinely keeping an eye on Gina and the top people at Apex. We agreed not to put Denim under surveillance, since he, as a security guard, would likely notice the attention, no matter how good Asimov's men were. But she will force people to dig through phone and credit card records, making sure it's done at a safe distance so Denim doesn't find out. I emphasized to them that I was no fool in Denim. Tracking him or trying to bug his phone, his home, or office is a really bad idea. I'll bet he'll catch up with us within a day or so. I see, Vera answered. But I would like to place audio and video in your house as well as a bug in Gina's purse and wiretapping of her mobile phone. We agreed that I would inform them when the house was empty. She promised that her team would complete the job in no more than three hours. The first thing they'll do is search the house to make sure Denim hasn't already installed surveillance equipment himself. As for Gina's purse and phone, I gave them the address of her tennis club. Vera assured me that she would pick her locker without any problems, quickly check her bag and phone for bugs, and lock up her own. My part was simple. Go home and pretend everything was fine. Continue to live your normal life at work and at home, watching my back. Asimov was sure that whoever tried to kill me would wait a little before contemplating another attempt. At the very least, they will have to make sure that your Lexus is destroyed, so there is no trace of the first attempt. And in a few days we will have enough information to understand what is happening. So don't do anything stupid, Alex. Don't go into the forest and don't go to unfamiliar places. Don't even try to drive alone. Find an excuse for Gina to drive you to work and stuff. But I don't think you need to worry right now. I smiled ironically at him. Easy for you to say, Barry. But I'll try to be as careful as possible. Before I left, we developed a communication system. All this will be in one direction, from me to Asimov. I would continue to use disposable cell phones. When I was free, I would dial the number and ask for Larry Asimov. The secretary will be tasked with correcting my mistake and then transferring my call directly to Barry. We agreed that I would call at least every other day. Back at the Beverly Wilshire, I had some lunch, then called Gina and told her I'd be back a day early. She was talking animatedly on the phone, teasing me about how lonely and cold she felt in our big bed, and I promised to warm her up on Thursday night. When I hung up, I realized how crazy it seemed that my wife had conspired to kill me. Before all this started, I would have said that I had no illusions about Gina. She was beautiful and sexy, adventurous and energetic, but at the same time self-centered and a little cold. She was not a bloodthirsty woman who collected stray cats. Her main interest was herself, and it didn't take long to know her to understand that. And yet I would say that she loves me in her own way. She wasn't a warm, caring wife, but I wasn't a particularly touchy husband either. We hardly sat by the fireplace or took leisurely walks along the beautiful beaches. We were both ambitious, goal-oriented people. And although Gina no longer worked, she energetically pursued the things that interested her. Tennis, shopping, time with her friends, sex with me. I would say that Gina loves me in her own way. 
In fact, I would say that Gina loved me as much as she could love anyone, given her basic nature. And given my own basic nature, that was enough for me. I liked our life together. I was happy. But, needless to say, all these assumptions could now be used. Although the thought that she might try to kill me was shocking, the preliminary evidence certainly pointed to it. It was not difficult to come up with a motive. Money, fool. And if what Dan Camoran told me was true, she could be connected to at least two of my partners. Josh Daniels from Apex and my friend Jeff Denham. In other words, if all my worst suspicions were true, she was a monster. A cold-blooded, heartless, evil bitch. If she did indeed sleep with Daniels, try to seduce Dan Camoran, and was somehow involved with Denham, it would suggest that she was the driving force behind it all. I spent most of the plane ride back to San Jose thinking about how things might turn out. I was convinced that I could be a good enough actor to fool Gina for a while. If she was really cheating on me, it would be a challenge to see if I could do the same. And if by some miracle my suspicions turn out to be wrong, I will be more than happy to open my heart to her love again. But if she was behind the attempt on my life? Let's just say I already had some ideas about how I wanted it to end, and part of me was looking forward to it. My reunion with Gina on Thursday night was wonderful in several ways. First of all, the sex was amazing. This happens almost always when we break up. Whether it's love for me or pure lust on Gina's part, I don't know. But either way, I'm not complaining. She ordered Chinese food because she knew I liked it. But she also greeted me in a short robe with nothing underneath. And I decided I'd rather stay in the bedroom for a while before we ate. We had a quick, energetic romp that left us both out of breath. And then we showered together and went downstairs to eat dinner. The second reason why Thursday pleased me is that there was nothing special about it. As you can imagine, I watched Gina very carefully for any signs of guilt, anxiety, or wariness. And there was nothing. She was herself, with the usual stories of beating Sharon Combs 6-4 in the third set, how she found exactly the shoes she wanted but, unfortunately, the wrong color, and so on. I was convinced that she had no idea about my suspicions. When I got to the office on Friday, Jeff Denham had already called and said he was on his way. No surprise there. He probably wanted to report on the audit I requested. Moreover, I was sure that he would try to find out why I asked for it. He wanted to make sure that I had no suspicions about what he was up to. Jeff walked in with a smile on his face, shook my hand, and said, Hey man, how's Los Angeles? I immediately wondered how he knew about my impromptu trip. Did he talk to Gina? But I wasn't going to make him wary by asking, and he could have called the office and heard about it from Meredith anyway. Hi, Dowdle, I answered with the same smile. Los Angeles was fine. Dan Camoran thought he had a lead for me on a new account, but I'm not sure it would work. It was nice to see him, though. Are you here to tell me what your guys found out? He sat down in a chair opposite my desk. Yes. It was a routine. They did find a couple of accounting errors, just a small thing. I passed them on to Pogrebin downstairs, but there was no sign of anything suspicious, no siphoning of funds or new payees, or any sign of outside interference. What made you ask me to do the audit, Alex? I watched Denham, and he seemed to be trying his best to make his question sound as casual as possible. It's good that I foresaw this and was prepared for my lies. I was almost sure it was nothing. But on Monday, I got a call from Bert Williamson. One of his vice presidents was at a meeting in New York, and one guy there was saying that he heard that one of the software firms in Silicon Valley was attacked. It was all very vague, something about fake subsidiaries that the money was being sent to. It sounded like bullshit, but it had been a long time since I asked you to check our accounts. So I thought, what the hell? I'm sorry I needlessly put your guys through this, but it's always better to know. He smiled at me, and it seemed to me that he relaxed a little. No problem, boy. That's what you're keeping us for. We chatted for a few more minutes about nothing. And as soon as he left, I went into Carlos's URL, downloaded and installed his software, and let his guys start checking Apex's finances and communications. I wanted to give them as much time as possible, so I asked Meredith to order lunch, telling her that I would be eating at my desk today. 
She also brought me the San Jose Mercury News, which I had not had time to read that morning, and as I was eating my lunch, I was interrupted by a story on the Metro page. Fire at auto repair shop destroys 12 cars. I read the article carefully. A fire broke out in the back parking lot of Marshall Motors. Police didn't yet know how it all started, but it completely engulfed a dozen cars and damaged six or eight more. I wasn't shocked. I assumed someone would steal my Lexus, but burning it to a crisp worked just as well, maybe even better, because it hid which car was the target. I called Dominic, reminding myself to be very careful with what I said. Barry and I both decided that Dowdle had probably bugged my office. Hey, Dominic, I just saw an article in the Mercury News. First of all, is everything okay? Yes, Alex, thank you. Last night it was already past ten and there was no one around. But if you're calling to inquire about your Lexus, I'm afraid I have bad news. This is a complete loss. It's okay, Dominic. That's what insurance is for. Is it okay if I come by for a few minutes after work today? We agreed that he would wait until I got there at six in the evening, and we hung up. I doubted that the surveillance tapes at Marshall Motors would have picked up anything suspicious, but I intended to ask Asimov's people to check them to be sure. Thank goodness Dominic wrote a report on the brake line and took some pictures. Whoever set my car on fire knew his stuff. Dominic showed me around the parking lot, now that the police and fire department had packed up and left. They think it's suspicious, he said, but they doubt they can prove it. Looks like that old Ford truck parked next to your Lexus. He pointed to a twisted, blackened piece of metal. Had a gas leak, and somehow a spark ignited it. The explosion set fire to all the other cars, he continued, vaguely waving his hand towards the destruction. We were standing in the parking lot hardly near the bug, so I quietly asked him, yes, from two different cameras, and the police filmed them, but I thought you might want to see them, so I made a copy for you. They're in my office, in the back of the drawer where we keep the coffee filters. God bless you, Dom. And now I want to ask you for one more favor, a very big one. I asked Dominic to wait until Monday and then send the security footage and his initial report of the car, along with photos, to Barry Asimov's office. I told him the address and made him remember it, repeating it several times. I also left my rented jalopy at Dominic's, thinking I'd use a taxi for a few days. If I picked them up in different places, acting spontaneously, it would be very unlikely that any of them would turn out to be a trap. Walking to the nearest taxi stand, I quickly called Larry, and within two minutes I was talking to Barry Asimov. Nothing special happened. Carlos has received a lot of material from my computer, but it will take him a few more hours to complete the download. I promised to try to get to the office over the weekend. Vera Anderson's team combed my house for bugs, found none, and installed their own. They also hacked Gina's computer password and copied her files, even though they hadn't read them yet, and they were all ready to grab Gina's purse the next time she played tennis. I told him about the Marshall Motors fire and that in a few days he would receive the records and report. We agreed that I would call back early next week. The next two days were so normal that it was almost strange. Gina and I did all our normal weekend activities. On Saturday we slept, made love in the morning, then Gina cooked bacon and eggs. We joked around the table, fed each other, and giggled. After lunch, we headed to our clubhouse where I played golf with my usual foursome, and Gina hung out with her friends by the pool. She was wearing a typically skimpy bikini, and with her stunning figure, she attracted more attention than all the other women there, which was good for Gina. We stayed at the club for dinner on the terrace with our friends Sam and Ashley, and then went home, where we made love again. On Sunday, we went our separate ways. I told Gina that I needed to spend part of the day in the office, which was not unusual. I asked her to drop me off, and then she went to the club to play tennis. I used my cell phone to tell Barry, and he promised that Vera would bring her operative into the locker room while Gina was playing. I went to the site, configured the software, and let Carlos do his thing. This gave me plenty of time to think. In particular, to wonder why I didn't get angrier. After all, my wife and my best friend seemed to be plotting to kill me. And Gina apparently had sex with me, at least Josh Daniels, if not others. 
so why am I not bursting with rage? All that came to my mind was, firstly, that I don't know for sure yet, and secondly, that revenge is a dish best served cold. Somehow I managed to hide my anger and feelings of betrayal in a small box, in the far corner of my mind. I'll have no problem getting even, or spending even a minute feeling sorry for Gina or Dowdle, but until the proof is in front of me, I won't allow myself to go crazy. At about 5.30, Gina picked me up, fresh from playing tennis, swimming and showering, and we grabbed some Indian food and had a quiet dinner at home. Neither of us seemed to want to make love, so we watched a couple of episodes of The Sopranos that we had watched on TV and hadn't seen yet, and then went to bed. The most normal weekend we've ever had. Nothing unusual happened on Monday, either. I pretended to be working in my office while setting up the software so David Carlos could finish downloading. But when I called Barry on Tuesday afternoon, sitting in the back booth of a downtown bar, I found that his people were making great progress. I want to tell you something, Alex. Let's start with your car. It was an arson, as we suspected. This is done by people who know what they are doing. Two guys dressed in black with ski masks so we'll never recognize them. They cut a tiny hole in the Ford's gas tank and then poured some more gasoline in there, which they brought with them, making sure there was plenty of it under your Lexus. Then they dropped the match and got the hell out. What about Dominic's photographs and documents? Will it be compromising? I think this will convince the police that someone was trying to kill you, but it's hard to see how they can link it to Denim or your wife without any further evidence. I thought for a moment. Okay, thank you. What else came up? David is done with your computer and his finance guys think they've found something. They'll need another day or two to be sure. It appears that someone was withdrawing money over a period of eight months, starting just over a year ago, through some fictitious subsidiary company. Maybe two million dollars was stolen, no more. Then the thing quietly closed. David is pretty sure he can trace it to a specific computer in your office if you give him a little more time. Is there a chance to get the money back? It's impossible to say for sure, but it's unlikely. The best thing to do would be to find out who did it, take him to the police, and demand compensation. If Hoover took it has already spent the money, then most likely it is gone forever. I didn't like it but I knew that losing $2 million wouldn't break me or the company. This was the principle of the game, and it made me very angry. However, compared to murder, the loss of money was clearly much less serious. Is there any news about Gina? Did Vera's people get bugs and get into her computer files? He cleared his throat. Things look bad, Alex. She seemed to be involved with two of the three Apex guys you gave us, Josh Daniels and Eddie Kreitler and on Sunday she called Denim from her cell phone, and it became clear that she was sleeping with him. Lord, I said. I realized that I wasn't that shocked, but it still felt like a blow to the head when my suspicions were so suddenly confirmed. Barry's voice brought me out of my dark thoughts. Look, give us a couple more days to put everything together. Vera's people are watching Gina's cell phone, the bug in her purse, and the bugs in your house. Plus, they're still working on her phone records and credit cards. It turns out that she had two cards in her maiden name, and monthly bills were sent to the mailbox. Did you know anything about this? Hell no, I replied, still feeling a little dazed. Alex, I know this really sucks. Do you think you can hang in there a little longer and keep your cool while we finish? I know I have to, Barry, so I guess I'll do it. Do you think they'll attack me again? There was a short pause. Then he said, They can. But they will be very, very careful because the news about your car is still so fresh. They won't want anyone to put two and two together. So if you take reasonable precautions, stay away from dark, secluded places and the like, you'll be fine. Do you want me to assign a couple of people to you? No. There's too much chance that Denim's guys will pick it up. No, I just need to take care of myself. I'll call you on Thursday. Sorry, Alex, he said in a surprisingly soft voice. Wednesday may have been the least fun day of my adult life. I knew my marriage was over. I knew that my best friend, the guy I'd known since junior high, the one I trusted more than anyone else, was sleeping with my wife. 
and I knew that one of them, or both, wanted to kill me. So I wandered aimlessly around the office, pretending to work, occasionally chatting with Meredith, while my mind chewed on the problem of how I was going to avenge myself. The details obviously depended on what exactly Barry and his team could figure out, but the general outlines of what I wanted to do were already clear in my mind. And as my anger began to rise, the feeling of insult and betrayal, the cold rage, I found myself looking forward to what was to come. On Thursday, I waited until late in the evening to call Asimov, wanting to give his people as much time as possible. At four o'clock in the afternoon, I went to my usual place to get my hair cut, and then, instead of going back to the office, I walked down the street to the diner, sat down at a table in the back with a cup of coffee, and called. Barry and I talked on the phone for almost an hour. I asked a lot of questions, made sure I understood everything he was telling me, and discussed various options with him. When we finally finished, he wished me luck and we said goodbye. I have what I need and I'll take it from here. That night, like the previous few, I received the Oscar at home, treating Gina with the same love and expressing the same sexual desire as usual. I won't say I'm a better liar or actor than her, but I think I was just as good. We ate fried chicken dinner that Carmelita had cooked, watched a movie on TV, and had sex before bed. It occurred to me that this would probably be the last time I had sex with Gina, possibly the last time I would ever touch her, but I didn't have the slightest desire to make it special. Now that I knew who she was, the physical attraction I still felt for her was mixed with such disgust and disgust that it was a little difficult to get aroused, at least at first. But to my surprise, Gina's gorgeous body and talented mouth solved this problem without difficulty, and we did the energetic, sweaty things we usually did. Then we wished each other good night and fell asleep. The end of my marriage, not with a groan, but with a bang. I left early on Friday, not wanting to talk to Gina anymore, and grabbed a quick breakfast on the way to the office. I took Gina's car, a BMW convertible. I was almost sure that her car had not been damaged, and I wanted her to work alive today. When she discovers that her car is missing, she will undoubtedly be annoyed. But that will be the least of her worries by the end of today. When Meredith arrived around 9Y, I called her into my office, said good morning, and handed her the list I had written. I'll have to change my schedule today, I said. Could you take care of all this for me, please? She looked at my list and I saw her eyes widen. She looked at me in surprise, clearly expecting an explanation. But when I remained silent, she simply nodded her head and said, Okay, boss, I'll take care of it. I left my morning pretty open except for meeting Nancy Leggett at Ten I Do. She was one of the principals at Leggett and Hein, a PR firm that worked for Apex for about six years, and she became a good friend. Nancy was an attractive businesswoman about my age. She was very insightful and had a great sense of humor. In fact, she was one of the few women I could date if I wasn't married to Gina. We talked in my office for almost an hour, in low voices, with my radio turned up quite loud, in case anyone might be listening. They would only hear a Beethoven symphony and a few Strauss waltzes. At my request, Meredith ordered me a sandwich and a soda, which I ate at the table while reading the newspaper. The real fun was supposed to start this afternoon around one sow. Meredith called and said Jeff Denham was calling. He wanted to see me right now. I smiled to myself and said, Tell him that I can't see him or talk to him right now, Meredith. He can meet me at four, the way I asked you to set his time. Does this mean Denham has a bug in my office? If he had done that, an hour of loud music while I was meeting with Nancy Leggett would probably have set him off. But something else could have alerted him. Perhaps he had tapped Meredith's phone or her office and heard her making arrangements for today, which I asked her to take care of. In any case, I knew that he was going crazy, and this thought made me very happy. Just wait, bastard. It's going to get a lot worse. A few minutes before one, I walked into the conference room to find it set up exactly as I had requested. The large conference table was empty, except for the company laptop at one end, which was open and running. At the far end of the room was a video camera on a tripod, with one of our technicians standing behind it, ready to film. 
Hello, I said. This is Arthur, isn't it? He smiled widely when he was remembered. Yes, Mr. McMillan, Arthur Wentner. Everything is ready and ready to go. Do you want me to stay and run it? Or should I just show you how it works? Just show me, please, Arthur. I want him to work all day, just filming the meetings I'm going to have here. He set it up so that it covered the part of the room that my guests and I would be sitting in, and we did a quick 30-second test. It worked great. The tape cassette holds six hours, so you must be prepared, Mr. McMillan. I thanked Arthur and he left. I fiddled with the laptop for a minute, then switched it to screensaver mode and leaned back in my chair. Less than two minutes later, Josh Daniels knocked on the door and carefully entered. It's finally begun. Josh, come in and sit down, please, I said with a friendly smile. Do you mind if we record the meeting? He looked worried and confused. Alex, it's me. What's the matter? We'll get to that in a minute. Do you understand what I asked Meredith? This meeting is completely confidential. You agree not to talk about any aspect of it with anyone at Apex now or in the future. He shrugged, still feeling awkward. Yes, of course, Alex, you're the boss. Is filming okay? I think yes, but why all this? I interrupted him. Wait a second, Josh. Everything will clear up in a few minutes. I leaned back in my chair, looking at him with a polite expression, watching his confusion. Finally, I spoke. Josh, I know everything about you and my wife. He visibly shuddered, trying in vain to appear calm. He could not take his eyes off me, as they were constantly boring into him. They kept slipping away from my face. Alex, uh, I don't know what, what you're talking about. No need to pretend, Josh. I have photographs. I told this lie with complete confidence, patting the thick folder lying next to me on the table. But now I would like to hear everything from you, please. You're in deep shit, and if you're not completely honest with me, it's only going to get worse. I've been in some pretty tooth negotiations in my business career, but I've never seen anyone more unhappy than Josh was at that moment, and I enjoyed every moment of his suffering, waiting for him to try to wriggle out of what he was caught in. Alex, I... can we turn off the camera? No, we cannot. Just keep going, Josh. I'm waiting. When did it start, and how? And how did you manage to justify sleeping with your boss's wife behind his back for months? He didn't take his ease off the table. Lord, Alex, this started about four years ago and lasted about three months. I think you know all this. Gina seduced me. That's what it was, pure and simple. Linda and I have known you and her for years, and she was always a little flirty. God, who wouldn't have a body like that? He stopped suddenly, cringing slightly at the thought of how that sounded. I just waited, and finally he continued. Anyway, she flirted with me a lot one time at a Christmas party we were having in that old ballroom. It was very obvious that she was flirting with me, but I couldn't believe she really meant it. And two weeks later, when you were in Chicago, she called me and asked me to come. When I arrived, she was wearing nothing but a long nightgown, completely transparent. I couldn't believe it, and I tried to leave. I swear to God. But she pulled me inside, locked the door, and just stood there leaning against it, looking at me with a smile on her face. Then she said something crazy like, I've wanted you for a long time, Josh, and now you'll be mine. Sorry, Alex. Really. Right now I feel like the worst asshole in the world, but I was 38 years old and I had never kissed such a stunning woman as Gina in my life. I knew it was wrong, but I let it happen. A team of guys with flamethrowers couldn't get me out of there. She took my hand and led me into the bedroom, and she... We... had sex for two hours. It was incredible, like nothing that had ever happened to me in my life. After that, I became her puppet. All she had to do was call, and I was there. Josh sat with his head in his hands, looking at the floor, completely broken. How long did this last, and how did it end? She did just that. And suddenly, one day, she said that she'd had enough. She wasn't even particularly nice. I'm pretty sure it was because I didn't want to do what she wanted. And what was that? I asked. 
He looked up at me for the first time since he began confession. Now he could look into my face. She wanted me to open some fake accounts to siphon money out of Apex. It was about the money, Alex. And that's all. She said you have all these millions, and she wants a bigger piece for herself. She asked me a lot of questions. In bed. I mean, after we... After about how our accounting systems work, whether it is possible to somehow create fake accounts, how dangerous it is, and so on. At first I thought it was just a joke, but she brought it up again and again. In the end, I just said I wouldn't do it. He straightened up in his chair. I won't lie to you, Alex. I won't lie to you again. I didn't refuse out of morality or loyalty to you or Apex. By then, I would have done anything to stay with Gina but I didn't see any way to do what she wanted without running a significant risk of getting caught, and I didn't want to go to jail, even for her sake. So when Gina realized that I really wouldn't do it, she just left me. And that was good, because Linda was sure that I was having an affair, but it was all over before she could get the evidence. I denied it over and over, just lied and lied and lied, swearing it was nothing more than a bunch of extra projects at work. I don't think she ever really believed me, but she let it go. And I did everything I could to make it up to her. And thank God we're still together. We sat in silence for several minutes. Much of what Josh said was new to me. Barry's people were able to find evidence of the affair. Multiple phone calls between Josh and Gina, as well as several heated emails from her to him, and they pinpointed the dates. But Josh's story about Gina being the ringleader was new information, as well as her hopes of stealing money from the company. I woke up. Okay, Josh, we're done for today. Go home for the weekend. Don't go back to your office and don't say a word about this conversation to anyone, inside or outside the company. Is this completely clear? I spoke in a neutral, cool tone. Yes, Alex. His voice sounded submissive and scared. I... That is, I... We'll talk on Monday, Josh. In the meantime, go home to Linda and the children. My conversation with Eddie Kreitler at 1.30 went about the same way. Eddie rose through the ranks at Apex. He led international sales and marketing before becoming the number two COO. Gina targeted him several months after she broke up with Josh, according to phone and email records, and it went on for more than six months. He was single so they both didn't have to be so careful. And the way Eddie talked about it, Gina was quietly bringing up the issue of stealing from the company, probably not wanting to scare him. He said it started out as a joke between them and only very gradually turned into something serious that she wanted him to do. He said he went so far as to think of several possible ways to do this, but never found one that didn't put him at too much risk. To be honest, Alex, it was because the company is well-managed. The oversight of our finances is tight, and I didn't see how I could handle it. And when I finally admitted it to Jean, poof, she's done with me. My conversation with Bernard Eisenhart, Apex's treasurer, took a completely different turn. When I said, Bernie, I know everything about you and my wife. He looked at me blankly, with an expression of surprise, but not in the least upset. What do you mean, Alex? Bernie. I have the photos right here. I patted the folder. There is little point in denying it. Photos? His voice sounded a little angry. I don't know what you have there, Alex, but if these are photographs of what I think, then you need to talk to Gina, not me. I turned my back and went to hell. I believed him, too. His annoyance was so obvious, and Barry told me that they found nothing between him and Gina other than one phone call from her to him. Okay, Bernie, I believe you. Could you tell me about this, please? He was still angry. She invited me, Alex. She told me some nonsense about a surprise party, wanting to know what you liked. Not that it makes any sense to me. And when I arrived, she... Well, you've seen the photos. Dressed in a sheer nightgown that didn't reach her hips, she pulled me towards her, kissed me, and tried to put her tongue in my mouth. I'm sure it's in the photos. What happened next? I told her there was nothing I could do about her, that she was married to my boss, and I unlocked the door and went back to the car and drove away. 
I didn't think there was any point in telling you this, Alex. Nothing happened, and frankly, I was afraid that you would blame me and not Gina, so I just left it alone. And now you're blaming me. His voice rose with anger, and I cut him off. Easy, Bernie, easy. Let me explain. I just found out that Gina cheated on me with at least two other people in the group, and I'm just trying to get to the bottom of it. I believe you. I believe that nothing happened between you. His anger disappeared, replaced by surprise. Two more people? God. He leaned back in his chair. Actually, I remember hearing rumors about her and Josh a few years ago. I didn't believe that, of course, figuring that's what people should say, given how attractive she was. But then, after she made that crazy pass at me, I was a little surprised, and yet it was none of my business. We talked for a couple more minutes. I reassured him of my confidence in him, reassured him that he had accused him, and reminded him to keep our conversation completely secret. And then he disappeared. As I sat there thinking about what I had learned, Meredith walked into the conference room. Alex, Jeff Denham is outside, and he's practically jumping out of his skin. I know you asked me to make an appointment for him at four o'clock, but he's about to wet himself. He says that he must meet you this very minute. It is a matter of life and death and so on. If it weren't for the guards you forced me to post outside, he would have burst in here by now. What do you want me to do with it? I smiled at her. Give me five minutes and then let him in. I wanted those five minutes to just savor what was about to happen. It's not every day you find out that your best friend wants you dead, and it's certainly not every day you have a chance to get even. When Jeff Denham walked into the conference room, he was literally shaking. He looked like someone on an espresso drip, although he tried to hide it. Hey, Alex, what's going on? It was said with deliberate casualness, but his voice was several tones higher than usual. Hi, Dowdle. Thanks for coming. Do you want coffee or something else? He shook his head. What kind of video camera is this? I smiled and said, I just thought I might need a report on the meetings I have today. You don't mind, do you? He looked very worried, but all he said was, but what is the big secret? Meredith didn't say anything to me, and when I passed Bernie Eisenhart coming out of the elevator, he just nodded at me in a weird way and moved on. I turned the laptop so it was facing him and said, when he tapped the built-in mouse, the screensaver disappeared, revealing a still frame from a video taken in my bedroom earlier in the week. It showed Gina, naked, lying on her back, with a naked Jeff nearby. After a split second, Denham looked at me with an expression of utter shock on his face. I waited until he said, Uh, Alex, I... and hit him with my right fist right under his right eye, as hard as I could. He flew back, hitting his head on the carpet. I stood over him, pulling off the thick winter glove I had placed on my hand. It still hurt like hell, but at least I didn't think I'd broken my knuckles. I sat for a while, smiling grimly and massaging my sore arm, waiting for Denham to come to his senses. Several minutes passed before he opened his eyes and groaned, feeling his face with his hand. When his head cleared a little, he looked around for me, then quickly moved away from me and sat against the wall, looking both shy and wary. Would you like some more, you slimy idiot? I can still hit you with my other hand. I spoke casually, almost flippantly. I saw him look at the door as if wondering whether he would be able to escape or whether I would have time to catch him. Forget it, Dowdle. Those two guards are still outside. You're not leaving yet. We sat for a while longer, and I watched him sullenly consider his situation. No doubt he hoped that I did not know everything, but he was bitterly disappointed. Okay, Dowdle, get up and sit back at the table. Don't worry, I won't hit you anymore. What lies ahead will be much more painful. He carefully stood up and sat down on a chair a good ten feet away from me, his eyes never leaving my face. I'm not going to waste any more time on you, you piece of shit. My best friend since elementary school. You're a fucking disgrace. He didn't bother to answer, so I continued. You not only slept with my wife and tried to steal my money, but you also tried to kill me. Here he jerked his head, looking at me in shock and alarm. 
and I will make sure that you make new friends in prison. Gina confessed everything to me, I continued, now lying through my teeth, and I know that the theft and murder were your idea. Wasn't that enough to just cuckold me? Did you think that knocking me over would just complete the picture? For God's sake, Alex, this is not true. There was absolute desperation in his voice. She's lying. I confess. I... We... I had an affair with Gina. There's no point in denying it now. But stealing the money and then killing you was her idea. I tried again and again to dissuade her. And when that didn't work, you said, what the hell and arranged for my car to be destroyed, right? He lowered his head without looking at me. A few minutes later, he told me everything. The romance started out much the same way as it did with Josh and Eddie. Gina turned her abs on full blast and Denim couldn't keep it in his pants. He swears he fought her off two or three times before he gave in, but it doesn't really matter, does it? When she had been sleeping with him for about three months, she started talking about stealing some of my money. Unlike her previous accomplices, Denim was willing to go with her. He invented a subsidiary company and found a way to have legitimate payments recorded in accounts receivable and then forwarded to the invented company. Since he was the head of security, he managed to keep anyone from getting close enough to find out what he was up to. Over the course of seven months or so, he was able to withdraw about $1.8 million. All of this was pretty much what Barry's people had already figured out. But that wasn't enough for Gina Alex. Now Denham spoke freely, not to mention the camera. He longed to take it off his chest. He wasn't such a complete jerk that he didn't feel guilty about what he did to me. She said you have so damn much money that a million or two just isn't enough for her. It's not fair. So I closed the account and tried to cover my tracks as best I could. A month later, she started talking about killing you. Then we could be together, Dowdle. Something like that. You can run the company or let other guys run it while you and I spend this wonderful money. She wasn't about to give up. Every time we, when we were together, she had a new idea that we'll do it later, when you die, and she inherits your money. And you believed her? He sighed heavily. I was a fool, Alex. The sex was incredible. The most exciting thing that ever happened to me. And I convinced myself that she loved me. I really was in love with her, or thought I was. I held out for a long time, and then she began to hint that if I didn't do this for her, then maybe we were not destined to be together. After a few weeks, it began to feel like this was my only choice. Alex, Gina is a cold-blooded monster. As soon as the thought came into her head, she became like a terrier with a bone. She just wouldn't let go. So I, finally I, made some calls and found a guy who knew how to do these things. He said that it would be no problem to ruin a brake line, and if everything was done correctly, no one would suspect anything. He looked at me with a pained expression on his face. I know that you will never forgive me, but I still can't believe that I did it. It was as if I was a different person, as if Gina was programming me and I was following her instructions, as if I were a little puppet. Were you going to try again? I already knew the answer after seeing the video that Asimov sent me. In a breathless voice, he said, I insisted that we wait a few weeks to make sure that no one suspected anything about the car. I tried my best to distract her, but eventually she would make me try again. She wasn't going to give up. He covered his face with his hands. Denim was broken and finished. He didn't even try to deny the truth. I asked him about the stolen money, and without hesitation he gave me the numbers of the two offshore accounts where he hid it. All but $60,000. Gina has already spent it. It was a little after 4.30. I handed Denham over to the guards, who will hold him until the police arrive. I then returned to the conference room and waited for Gina, who was scheduled to arrive at 5 d. With each successive revelation, the incredible and painful truth seemed to sink deeper. My wife not only abused me and stole my money, she tried to kill me. How does a normal person manage to do this? What did it mean that I lived with this woman, mostly very happily, for more than eight years, without having the slightest idea of who or what she really was? Gina entered the conference room, as usual. 
20 minutes late, looking charming and slightly annoyed. Baby, what does this all mean? Meredith practically ordered me to meet you here, and she didn't tell me anything about what you want. Is there something going on with the company? And why did you leave me without a car this morning? I watched her very carefully and saw that her irritation was an act. Gina was worried. In all likelihood, he and Denim were burning phone lines today, trying to figure out what was going on. Honey, just sit down, please, okay? It won't be easy for me. I sat quietly, as if struggling with my emotions, and watched as she tried her best to remain calm. I was determined to enjoy every fucking minute of it. After a long pause, during which Gina's knee began to shake nervously, I spoke. Gina, I know that you cheated on me. How could you do this to me? I thought you loved me. She tried to sit quietly, but her eyes widened and she tensed a little. I watched as her face took on an expression of sadness and compassion. It was impressively fast. She must have expected it. Baby, I'm so sorry. I never meant to hurt you. It's just, I think, you've been gone for so long, and I... She fell silent and began to cry, and convincingly, I might have softened if I had not known the whole truth. Still crying, she reached across the table and took my hand. Alex, is there any way to forgive me? I don't want to lose you. I don't know, Gina. I just don't know. Then, after another pause, I need you to tell me about it. When and how it started and when it ended. And why. First of all, why? Why did you do it? Oh, baby, please don't make me talk about it. We'll get through this. You'll see. I can make amends. I will be the best most ideal wife you can imagine. Gina, I said, making my voice crack. If we're ever going to end this, you have to be honest with me, here and now. When did it start? How long did it last? I held her by her short hair and enjoyed it. She didn't know which of her lovers was known to me. I deliberately spoke about her affair in the past tense so that she would think that it might not be Denim, but someone else. Now she had to guess. And if she guessed wrong, she would admit to an affair I didn't even know about. She reluctantly began to speak. As I said, Alex, that's how it was. You were often not at home and I felt lonely, abandoned. I know it's not fair. You've worked so hard and achieved success creating a company for both of us. But, but I guess I let him get to me. And then he, I had a couple of drinks and when he made the pass, I just gave up. I laughed to myself. Nice try, Gina, but you're not off the hook yet. When was this, Gina? I really need to know. She suddenly stood up from her seat, walked around the table, and tried to throw herself into my arms with tears in her eyes, screaming, Alex, I'm so sorry. But I held her at arm's length, still looking into her eyes, and asked, Who? I saw how, in a split second, a mental calculation appeared and then disappeared from her eyes. She sighed, sat down on the chair next to me and said, she bet on Josh Daniels. I chuckled to myself. Nice try, Gina. Too bad you don't know there is no right choice. And what? She looked at me, her irritation hidden slightly behind a mask of sadness, but she realized that she really didn't have much of a choice. And this went on for a couple of months. I don't know why, Alex. I'm just a little crazy. I knew it wasn't right, and I finally just told Josh I couldn't see him anymore. It was destroying me. I cried all the time, and... Josh? I interrupted her with a shout. You also cheated on me with Josh? If you could have seen the expression on her face at that moment. Desperately, eyes wide with fear, she said, Baby... I don't understand what... Eddie Kreitler wasn't the only one? I shouted at her. You slept with two of my employees? What the hell were you thinking? She tried to hold me back, but I was in shock. For God's sake, Gina, how can we fix this? How can I ever trust you again? God, everyone at Apex must have been laughing at me behind my back. The boss's wife sleeps with her subordinates. Just get in line, she'll get to you soon. Who else did you sleep with, the janitor? No, baby, I swear it was just the two of them. How can I believe this? I demanded an answer. As far as I know, 
you sleep with everyone I've ever dealt with. Did you film Dan Camoran before he left? What about our friend Archie, or Debbie's husband Peter, or Dowdle? How can I be sure that you didn't have sex with them? Gina realized that she had this opportunity and immediately intervened. Her face took on a solemn expression, and she reached out and took both my hands in hers. In a quiet, serious voice, she said, Alex, God knows it was only those two. And that was many years ago. I regretted it so much. Since then, I have been completely faithful to you and will be faithful for the rest of my life. Silence reigned in the room. I looked at her tiredly, sadly, hiding the evil joy that I felt at the thought of her inevitable death. Okay, Gina, I said slowly. Okay, you... You cheated on me with two of my employees, but then you stopped. You pulled yourself together and decided to become my faithful wife again. This is true? Yes, baby, she said, hoping to appear in her eyes. Well, there is... just... I guess I just need to ask you something else, I said, pushing the laptop towards her. Can you tell me what this all means? I touched two keys. This time, as the title screen faded, the video began to move. We saw Jeff's head bob between Gina's thighs, saw her arch her back in pleasure, and heard her harsh voice. Oh, yes, yes. Oh, baby. Oh, Dowdle, do it. Yeah, baby, do it. We have to give Gina credit. She didn't jump away from the laptop as if from a snake, didn't try to run away from the room, didn't even scream. Just a quick oh, which stopped almost as soon as it started. Then, after a few seconds, she closed the laptop and turned to me. Her face was almost unrecognizable from just a few moments ago. Now it was a hard, angry mask, its eyes sparkling and its lips tightly compressed in a grin. Okay, Alex, you caught me. Well done. What do you want me to say? Yes, I was with fucking Dowdle, and he is much better than you. Is this true, Gina? Does this explain why you tried to kill me? It shocked her. She froze, staring at me for a minute, and the best she could get out was, I have no idea what you're talking about. Really? I said softly. I opened the computer, pressed a few buttons, and turned it so she could see. The scene was our kitchen. Gina and Denim were sitting together at the table, both in dressing gowns. Gina spoke. I don't care, Dowdle, that we were unlucky and he didn't crash the car. You can try again. Gina, you don't understand how risky this is. If someone starts to find out what happened, they... Bullshit! You burned the car, right? She is completely destroyed, along with a bunch of others. Who can suspect anything? We just need some other way to kill him. Can't you poison him or shoot him to make it look like a robbery? I pressed a button, and the computer went silent. I smiled at Gina. I wish I had this video, huh, baby? It would be quite difficult to stand up in court and deny that you had anything to do with this. I watched Gina's cold eyes as the wheels turned behind them. She was a rat caught in a disgusting trap, looking for a way out from every corner. She no longer tried to look pathetic or even affectionate. When she finally spoke, her voice was quiet and contemptuous. You will never go to the police with this, Alex. It would make you a laughingstock and make Apex a laughingstock. The head of a multi-billion dollar company and his wife is cheating on her employees. You will be the world's fool. She leaned back with a satisfied and contemptuous look. I picked up the phone and asked Meredith to call Nancy Leggett. When she came in, she sat down at the table across from Gina and me and looked at my wife like she was a bag of dirty laundry. Nancy, my sweet wife Gina thinks it would be bad for me and for the business if I arrested her for grand theft and attempted murder. Why don't you tell her what you told me this morning? With a big smile, Nancy replied, Of course, Alex. This story, Gina and Denim with their dirty little plot, will be the biggest story on cable news for some time. It's got it all. Money, adultery, attempted murder, an extremely attractive woman, a man's betrayal of his best friend, you name it. This will be more than Paris Hilton, more than the saga of Anna Nicole Smith. Gina will be the harlot of the month for a while, and Apex will get more advertising than it has in the company's entire life. 
more advertising than $500 million in advertising could buy, all for free. Alex will find himself on Larry King, The Today Show, you name it. He will be an honest, hardworking businessman, the victim of an unscrupulous whore and her puppet. By the time the trial is over and Gina and Denim are in prison, Apex will be written about in Business Week and the Wall Street Journal. Someone will give Alex the Entrepreneur of the Year award. The company would have maybe $100 million in new business, and Alex would receive 10,000 letters from women dying to be the next Mrs. McMillan. Some of them will send photos. This is just a godsend for Apex. Not much fun for your husband, Gene, at least for now, but you're going to make a rich, successful man even richer and more successful. As his PR representative, I could never have dreamed of coming up with something so good. Nancy winked at me, stood up, and left the room. Gina leaned back in her chair, her eyes a little distracted, and her mouth in a deep frown. Perhaps for the first time in all the years that I knew her, she looked completely broken. I picked up the phone. Meredith, you can call the police now. The next 14 months may or may not have made up for what came before. It's a tough call. But they provided their fair share of entertainment. Police charged Gina and Denham with attempted murder, conspiracy to commit murder, fraud, conspiracy to commit fraud, grand larceny, and six or seven other things. Apex's attorneys also immediately filed a civil lawsuit seeking the return of the stolen money, the whereabouts of which we learned through Denham's confession. And of course, I immediately filed for divorce on the grounds of adultery. Fortunately, due to criminal and civil complaints, all of Denham's accounts and all of Gina's and mine accounts, to which she had access, were frozen. By the time they were both released on bail, they didn't have the money to hire expensive lawyers to defend them and had to make do with public defenders for a while. I threw Gina out of the house and had no trouble getting a judge to put a restraining order on her. The video of her and Denim discussing the second attempt to kill me was pretty convincing. She asked Susan, one of her tennis friends, to temporarily put her up in Susan's guest house. Gina never tried to contact me, although I did not expect or want to. She must have realized that she couldn't say anything that would make any difference. On the Monday after Gina's day of reckoning, I called Josh and Eddie and fired each of them. None of them were terribly surprised. Eddie only asked that if a potential future employer called me for a reference, I would be willing to say that his work for Apex was good. I agreed without difficulty. Josh tried to make a deal with me. If I helped him find a decent job, he would agree to testify against Gina at the trial. I laughed him out of my office. I reminded him that I already had his confession to the case and her attempt to get him to steal from the company on tape. If he does not agree to testify, the prosecutor's office will simply issue him a subpoena. I promoted Bernie Eisenhart to Josh's CFO position with full confidence that he would do a top-notch job. I asked him to take over the job of interviewing for his own replacement as treasurer and for Eddie's position. Gina and Denham's trial began approximately seven months later. This went on for almost three weeks. I went to court a few times, but didn't feel the need to be there every day. Unsurprisingly, they were in no position to deny what they had done, and each lawyer's defense focused on making the other the big bad guy. Gina's main assets were her beauty and her ability to act, lie, on the witness stand. The men on the jury ate it. The trouble, of course was that there was a video that clearly showed her pushing a reluctant dowdle to make another attempt on my life, and not even Gina could overcome it. They were both found guilty on eight counts, including all major ones. By the end of the trial, all the hype had allowed Gina to sign several contracts for magazine and television interviews, enough to pay for some expensive legal talent. New lawyers have filed appeals and have managed to delay sentencing so far, but Gina and Dowdle appear to be facing 10, 15 years or so. All the stolen money was returned to Apex minus $72,000. Since Denham's security firm had closed, I needed someone to take over the role for Apex. When I flew to Los Angeles to pay Barry Asimov and thank him for everything he had done, he suggested that I hire David Carlos. David's dream is to move to the Bay Area, and you've seen how good his work is. I don't think you will regret offering him a contract, 
and with you as his main client, he can build a business there. So I offered Carlos a job, and so far everything is going very well. While I was in Asimov's office, he surprised me with another piece of video that I didn't know about. There was no time to talk to me about this before, and it had nothing to do with the threat from Gina and Denim. Come into the cinema for a minute, Alex. I think you'll enjoy it. To my surprise and amusement, there, in bed with Gina, his flabby, pot-bellied body bouncing on top of her, was Charlie Pemberton, my lawyer. He was almost 60 and didn't seem to be giving Gina much pleasure, although he certainly enjoyed the ride himself. After they finished, which didn't last very long, they chatted in bed. I think Gina seduced him a couple of months ago and put him to work trying to find a way around our prenuptial agreement. It is not surprising that since Charlie was an excellent lawyer and drafted the project himself, it was not very successful. But that didn't stop him from enjoying Gina's favor whenever she gave him the opportunity. I especially enjoyed burning Charlie's ass. I accused him, as publicly and loudly as I could, of unethical behavior, and the California Board of Legal Ethics had no choice but to revoke his license. I also sued him and took about $240,000 of his savings that I donated to charity. All this gave me great pleasure. As far as Apex and I were concerned, everything went exactly as Nancy Leggett predicted. This generated a flurry of publicity, especially on cable news and in the tabloids. I've been on CNN, on the cover of Fortune magazine, on the front page of the National Enquirer, and just about everywhere in between. Nancy had to hire three new employees to handle the workload, and she and I met almost every day to plan strategy and decide which interviews and other offers to accept. The boon for Apex's business was nearly 20% growth in the first six months after the story broke. Nancy was right about the letters from women, too. So far, there are more than 8,000 of them, and they continue to arrive. After reading the first 200, some with provocative or even downright lewd photographs, I assigned one of her interns to answer them. As far as I know, this guy regularly is engaged sex. Local divorced and single woman also came out of the woods. But to my surprise, I found that I wasn't very interested. Gina made me very happy sexually until everything fell apart and I felt the need to sow wild oats. I went on dates with four women I was attracted to and slept with two of them, but I quickly confirmed that the promiscuous lifestyle really wasn't tempting me. After several weeks of working closely with Nancy, I discovered that she was the one I wanted to date. We've been dating for almost a year. None of us are in a hurry to get married, but it may happen after a while. Last Sunday was my birthday and Nancy gave me something special. We spent Saturday evening at her house, watched an old movie with Humphrey Bogart, and then made love. Sex with Nancy is wonderful, sweeter and more relaxed than sex with Gina, who liked it hard, sweaty, and sporty. With Nancy, it's not just about the sensations, it's about the feeling of closeness, and that's great. On Sunday morning, she let me sleep while she prepared breakfast and brought it to the bedroom. I opened my eyes and saw her standing there in her robe, holding breakfast on a large tray. We ate together, and then she said, Ready for a gift? Actually, I wear it under my robe. I raised my eyebrows questioningly, but she just grinned. Are you ready? She asked. She then took off her robe and stood posing in front of me. She was wearing only a white T-shirt that covered her just below her hips, showing off her long legs. On the shirt was a scanned image of an angry Gina, no doubt taken from a photo of her that Nancy had found in my home. Beneath the photo, in large block letters, was written, I survived the monster. I laughed and laughed and then said, Come here. I pulled Nancy with me onto the bed, and after a few minutes we took off our shirt. Subscribe to our channel so that your second chaff doesn't cheat on you and go ahead and listen to the next story, because this story is nothing compared to the next one. If you're under 18, don't even think about listening to the next one.